Sure. Okay. Uh, good evening, guys. Sorry for the delay. Um, a few things happening, but yes, uh, welcome to this tutorial shared by Professor Roche. I'll be talking about acute simple elbow dislocation. So we just discussing current concept. We spoke about about it a little bit sometimes last 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 year. So. As we all know by now, um, elbow dislocations are ranked second as part of large joint dislocations, second after shoulder dislocations. And this will happen as a sport injury, or it may also happen as uh, injury during recreational activities. And what you do to the dislocated elbow at the initial setting will strongly influence the outcome of that shoulder, that elbow dislocation. So that's what we will be kind of uh, focusing on. Um, so before we get into the middle of it, uh, let's just look at the elbow stability. Uh, you get primary stabilizers and secondary uh, stabilizers. In the primary rank, uh, you, get, you have mostly static uh, stabilizers that would include MCL on the medial side, which resist valgus instability or valgus moment. And you have lateral ulnar collateral ligament on the lateral side resisting various forces. And the ulnar humeral joint helps you in both valgus verus, but also provides you rotational stability. And in the secondary rank, you found the radiocapitular joint, which is a secondary stabilizer against valgus. And common flexors, which are dynamic stabilizers, secondary for valgus as well. And common extensors, which are uh, dynamic and resist virus deformity. And don't forget the capsule. The capsule is a static structure and it provides you with various vagus and rotational stability. So the mechanism of injury that produces elbow uh, dislocation is very much debated. Uh, back in 1992, Odrisco came up with his mechanism of injury being uh, that the injury will happen with the elbow semi-extended, which means semi-flexed. And then the, uh, the forearm is in supination and as the patient is falling, uh, there is an external rotation moment that will produce an injury that must start on the lateral side. So previously we thought with all acute elbow dislocation, the primary injury is on the lateral side and progresses through the anterior capsule all the way to the medial side. But as it has been shown now, it is actually a little bit different. Uh, from this. So uh, Joseph looked at uh, videos that had been recorded of people falling over and, and dislocating the elbows. According to those videos, what they, those videos were looked at by a fellowship trained shoulder and elbow surgeon. They came up with the conclusion that with most posterolateral dislocation, the arm was, uh, the elbow was in full extension uh, there was axial loading and valgus moment with progressive supination. Uh, so, which is a different theory from Odrisco's original one. And the, the soft tissue injuries produced during this mechanism of injury will differ in terms of the sequence and the degree uh, of soft tissue injuries. Uh, so, when uh, Joseph again looked at MRI findings of acute elbow dislocations, uh, they came up with the conclusion that with most posterolateral elbow dislocations, there was injury mostly on the medial side. So you'd find a full tear of uh, MCL, medial collateral ligament, with sometimes you find the flexor pronator mass injured as well. And there were very few injuries on the lateral side, which tends to agree with the video study. And with this uh, most recent study from 2019, they also looked at uh, the MRI findings of 
um, all injuries found in posterolateral and posteromedial elbow dislocations. They tried to correlate it to the mechanism of injury reported by the patient. So here the conclusion was, when you're looking at a posterolateral elbow dislocation, the mechanism of injury may vary. So you'll find different kinds of mechanism of injuries which will lead to the, the same uh, postural lateral elbow dislocation. So the direction of your dislocation does not necessarily tell you which was the mechanism of injury. And the soft tissues as well were found to be more prominent or more common on the medial side than on the lateral side. So what is all this about? All I can tell you from all these studies I've looked at is that the mechanism of injury actually doesn't matter. Your elbow is dislocated, it is dislocated. What you're worried about is what are the structures that are injured? Will these structures heal with a conservative treatment or will it require surgery? So essentially that's your exercise in your mind, that's the question you're trying to answer. And as we all know by now already, 90% uh, of acute elbow dislocations, uh, mo most of them are posterolateral dislocations and they will heal with conservative treatment. It's only about 10% of those that will most likely need surgery that we have to worry about. This is what this talk is about, to be able to single out those 10% that are likely to need a surgical intervention to prevent uh, recurring or chronic instability. So classification, uh, elbow dislocation were classified in 1969 already by Britt and his, uh, his colleagues. They classified into two broad group, a simple elbow dislocation, which means it's a soft tissue injury only. There are no associated fractures. And the second group, which is the complex elbow dislocations. Uh, in the second group, you have soft tissue injury and fractures. So this is 1969. Get to two 2017, Lars and his colleagues, after looking at a series of elbow dislocations, they have realized that the way cases where there was extensive soft tissue injury involving either on the medial side, the flexor pronator mass and the anterior capsule, or the common extensor and the anterior capsule on the lateral side. And this group of uh, dislocation are the one that are gonna remain unstable after close reduction and are the one that are gonna need surgery to restore stability. So that group, they have then classified it into a group they call complex soft tissue only. So today, if you wanna classify an elbow dislocation, it's a new concept. Yeah. Uh, you have simple soft tissue dislocation and then you have complex soft tissue only uh, dislocation and you have your complex <coughs> fracture dislocation. This is just to bring out the second group that is likely to uh, need surgery for stability. So clinical evaluation, this again, you keep in mind uh, which group, which patient you're dealing with, is this patient gonna be one of the 10% that will require surgery? Is this patient gonna be one of the run of the mill 90% that are gonna do well with conservative treatment? But before you get that, uh, if it is high energy injury, as most of them will be, you've got to rule out associated injuries, go through your ATLS, assessment, neurovascular uh, status before and after reduction and proceed to uh, stability assessment. I think I'm missing uh, a slide. So when you are assessing for stability, essentially when you have, I'm gonna go one slide back. When you're assessing for stability, when you have reduced the elbow, the first thing you do is you check stability through range of motion. There is no various involvement. There's no vulgar instability that you're gonna check. Just run them through range of motion. You start them at uh, 90 degrees uh, flexion and slowly extend and see what happens. If your elbow is dislocating uh, between 90 and 45 degrees of, flex of, of flexion, you have an instability problem. That patient will need surgery. If they are 
dislocating between 45 and 50 degrees of flexion, then you can pronate them and see if pronation restores stability to 50 degrees of flexion. If that is the case, then this patient must be immobilized in pronation for at least 10 days, up to, up to 14 days. So if you can easily get them to 30 degrees in flexion without instability, that is a stable situation. These are the ones you can treat either in a sling for 10 days or back slab for 10 days and start uh, neuro uh, start your rehabilitation. So the goals of treatment will be to um, obtain concentric reduction, uh, prevent chronic instability and prevent stiffness. So I've already spoken a little bit about instability assessment. This is the slide, what you're gonna do on clinical examination. After you've done your clinical examination, there is another opportunity to check for stability. And that will be through uh, X-ray examination. So if you've done your reduction, you have your post-op X-ray or post-manipulation X-ray, look out for congruency of the joint. If you have increased gap between the distal humerus and the olecanon, that's called the drop uh, sign. It tells you that there is instability uh, with this um, elbow. I must just say here that you would find some drop sign which are post-operative. A post-operative drop sign may be due to muscle relaxation still, um, lack of tone in the muscle. Those are not necessarily a sign of instability. They can be treated with active range of motion. But a drop sign that follows an acute elbow dislocation has to be taken more seriously than the one you get post-operatively. So this is what a drop sign will look like. Uh, for this patient, then you need um, extra investigations. You can either uh, proceed to an MRI which will show you the degree and the size of injury. Uh, you, like on this slide here, you will see that all the medial soft tissues are nowhere to be seen. So they're all disrupted. If you don't have an MRI, if it MRI is a problem, your other option is to do a fluoroscopic examination and anesthesia um, or under sedation. You can also do that preferably in theater so you can proceed if you have to. So what you do then, this is where you have to apply your valgus and virus uh, stress, and you have to measure uh, how much either medial or lateral opening you're getting. If you have more than 10 degrees uh, of this angle here, you are already in an instability situation. It will be nice to compare it to the normal side. Then you have exactly an idea of what's going on, but uh, even if you didn't compare it to the normal side, if you have an opening of more than 10 degrees, that is uh, an instability problem. So this clinical assessment is different from what you would do for chronic instabilities. Uh, chronic instabilities, which could be due to overuse or all dislocation where you have to do your milking maneuvers, you do uh, your modified milking moving virus or moving valgus test, your gravity uh, assisted test, that suits well your chronic situation. The patient have less pain than in an acute situation, you will do all those. That is another talk uh, for another day, but this is what you do in an acute setting. So according to this instability assessment, uh, this paper here came up with a study where they looked at what would be the treatment strategy or treatment recommendation for treating um, acute elbow dislocations? They did a retrospective study where everybody that uh, did not redislocate but had instability on assessment was taken to theater to measure the angles. And on a retrospective review, the grade one laxity where the angle was less than 10 degree angulation or opening on virus or valgus testing did well with conservative treatment. But if the uh, opening angle was more than 10 degrees, 
those who had surgery did better than those who did not have surgery. It means that those who had uh, stabilizing surgery or, uh, did well. So grade three laxity, of course, these had surgery. So then what we're saying is for that 10% of people that you may be worried about instability on your clinical examination, you should proceed to either an MRI or a radiographic examination, a fluoroscopic examination in theater. And if you find out it is a grade one laxity, fine. Conservative treatment is in order. If you find out it is grade two laxity, current recommendations are you should repair the injured structures. And if you have a grade three laxity, of course, then definitely you will go through your uh, scale of surgery, medial, lateral, uh, as required in, in theater. So say you're dealing uh, with a grade two or a grade three uh, laxity, you should start on the side of gross instability. And according to what you find on your fluoroscopic examination, you are likely to find if you're dealing with grade three or grade two instability, that the medial side is the most unstable, then that's where you're going to start. But in some other dislocation, like if you're dealing with a posterior medial elbow dislocation, then you may find that your most involved structures are on the lateral side. So that's where you would start. You would start your uh, uh, surgery there. Once you've addressed the most uh, unstable structures, then you test stability again. If your elbow is now stable, then that's all about what you will do. If it is still unstable, then you're gonna to move to the less injured structures. And in the end, if you're still worried about instability, then you should think about adding an hinge external fixation. So should you do a primary ligament repair? That means a couple of anchors in the bone, in the distal humerus, and uh, whip stitch the injured structures and put them back on the uh, origin on the distal humerus. What are the results? So when that was done uh, in 2005 by Odrisco, they reported the result. They reported 50% recurrent instability. So that, is, that was quite worrying and they started trying some reconstruction technique, but current results aren't that as bad as the ones they had. Uh, this study here, 2008, so three years later, they reported excellent result with primary ligament repair. And again, another study in 2015 uh, also reported on the primary ligament repair, 21 cases. They had excellent result in 12 cases, good result in seven. So I think there is still uh, space there is still role of a direct primary ligament repair. And at Cruz Care Hospital, that's about what we do for the acute cases. If we go in for acute cases, we will go for uh, direct primary ligament repair. We won't be having grafts and things like that, which are considered in chronic instabilities. So this other paper here just came up uh, to just uh, mix things a little bit. They considered primary repair plus augmentation and the augmentation they used were internal braces. So according to this paper, they found out that the patient who, were, who had a ligament primarily repaired, but also augmented, they were likely to be rehabilitated better and earlier uh, than those that were just primarily repaired. So it's something to consider. We need more papers about this. We are doing primary repair and we are quite happy with it. Uh, this is another paper on primary repair plus augmentation. Uh, I'm three minutes over my 20 minutes. No, what, no problem, Jimmy, no problem, no, no rush. Okay, thanks, Prof. Uh, so, so that is an option. Uh, if you're dealing with um, high level, athletes that want to go back play and you don't want to delay any delay in rehab, you may consider 
adding some sort of support, internal breast to your primary repair. So just a word on pediatric consideration. Uh, here, all I wanted to bring to your attention was, uh, you will see some patient with um, medial epicondyl fractures. So this patient generally medial epicondyl fractures are considered uh, benign injuries. If they're not displaced, you can treat them conservatively. But one thing you need to make sure on follow-ups is that there is no instability uh, because some elbow may, uh, as, as on my next slide, you may have a valgus, severe valgus instability without a true elbow dislocation ever happening. So you may find some younger athletes presenting with medial epicondyl fractures. You must think in stability and you must, uh, in your follow-up, make sure that the elbow is unstable, especially in the pediatric athlete patients. Uh, so if you're dealing then with a medial epicondyl, a couple of indications there to keep in the back of your mind. If it's an open injury, it should be fixed. Uh, if it was a dislocation and it is trapped in the joint after relocation, then you must go fetch it out and fix it. If it presents with other symptoms, it must be fixed. If it is displaced more than five millimeters, it must be fixed as well. And again, at the bottom there, you must remember about the upper extremity athlete. They want their elbow stable uh, for those late cooking stages in their throwing movement. So I, I showed this case uh, last year for those who were there. It was a medial epicondyl fr a fragment that was trapped in the joint, which was uh, initially missed in the periphery, but we we could see it on the WhatsApp images, which brings our group quite nice day. And we called the patient in for open reduction and internal fixation. So this is uh, another, this here is a paper that reported a series of seven uh, severe acute elbow valgus instability without prior dislocation. The paper is at the bottom there. You can go read it yourself. I think published last year. Uh, so mostly it's sport injuries and it's those patients that fall down and as they're trying to balance on the outstretched hand, they sustain a massive valgus moment with disruption or aversion of the common flexor pronator mass, but they never dislocated. So these should be also treated as complex soft tissue uh, elbow instability, and they are likely to require surgery to restore stability and early range of motion. So that's also uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, when the patient will come to you, they're not going to say, I've got a massive vargas instability, doctor. They're going to say, I've got elbow pain. And then they're going to point that their pain is on the medial side. But then if you inquire about how the pain started, they will say it was during a game. And in your mind, you're already thinking this medial elbow pain may not just be a golfer's elbow. It can be actually a massive instability. And then you're going to take them through your uh, instability test, uh, milking or uh, moving valgus or valgus stressing, and proceed on to getting an MRI or examination under fluoroscopy and decide uh, on surgery as your stabilizing solution. So in summary, uh, you must be able to classify your, the degree of instability of your elbow that you're dealing with before the patient is released. If you think it is just a grade one laxity, carry on as you always do. This will be uh, the case in most cases. Uh, if you're dealing with grade two and grade three instability, the current recommendations are surgery starting on the most injured side. And whatever you do, you must be able to get that elbow moving within 10 to 14 days to prevent stiffness. Thank you very much. I'm sure you remember this picture from last year. That's it, Prof. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here, Jimmy. 
Thanks. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the talk. Thanks very much, Jimmy. So th this is an amazing thing that we see elbow dislocations all the time. And when we ask the registrars or even um, speak to other orthopedic surgeons, they don't have a clear understanding of who needs surgery and who doesn't surgery. And I get lots of questions from the shoulder and elbow guys who get an MRI scan and say, does this need an operation or this doesn't need an operation? Because the MRI reports this massive injury every time. 80% have an MCL, 70% have a PCL, I mean a lateral collateral, 100% have an anterior capsule tear and a little bony fragment. And I get the same question. So I hope Jimmy's cleared it up for you a little bit more. You have to be a little bit aggressive in some patients. And those, uh, those patients you must be able to identify from uh, the history, the x-rays, as Jimmy's shown you, a clinical examination, and then possible special investigation. Does anybody have, I, we're going to touch on a few of the other things just now, so I'm not going to go too deeply in that. Does anybody want to ask any questions at the moment? Okay, well, you can ask the questions while I'm, um, Jimmy, you need to stop sharing screen. Stop sharing. Okay. And I'm going to now share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's make this bigger. So, Bayanda, are you there? Bayanda? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm just moving these things out the way so I can manipulate some of the things here. Uh, Beyonder, um, so we're going to talk about the, what was called the terrible triad. Um, and I'm going to ask you, what's your definition of a terrible triad of the um, shoulder, of the elbow? Um, my definition of the terrible triad would be uh, radial head dislocation. Um, I'm trying to think now. Radial head dislocation. Okay, name somebody else beyond that. They can give us a dis name. Somebody else? Anybody? The only person I can see here is PV okay. on my thing. Okay. Who's PV? Answer, guys. That's Who's me. Name? It's an elbow dislocation with a radial head fracture and a lateral on the collateral injury. Anybody else want to add to that? It's an amazing, guys. A terrible try is a very common question in exams, and it's a, not an uncommon problem. You still so haven't terrible, got the answer. Terrible try is uh, uh, there will be a fracture of the coronoid, and there will be dislocation of the elbow, and there will be uh, uh, fractures of the, of the radial head or the radial neck. Uh, radial neck yeah. Okay, so it's an elbow dislocation. Yes, so coronoid fracture. fracture. And a rattle head, neck, or head or yeah. neck. Yeah. Okay. So we all understand what we, we what we um, talking about now. So if you look at the more recent literature, some people have now recommended not to talk about the terrible triad because some of the results are not as bad as we thought because our treatment regimes have changed. So the most re recent paper in January this year published suggests that we call it the complicated triad of the uh, uh, of the elbow, okay. So, um, who, who's PV? It's Peter Fenton. Okay, Peter. I want you to tell me now, um, what do you think when you're treating, uh, uh, when you're treating a, a terrible triad or a complicated triad of the elbow, why do you think that we make the algorithms and uh, for them? What do you think that's all based on? Philosophically, what, what do you think? What, when you're treating them, what are you trying to do? You're looking at what the outcome would be. Okay. And what the functionality afterwards would be. What, what is those outcomes going to be? What, what, what I'm trying to ask you, when, when you approach to a problem, you, you want to be doing something for that patient 
And the principles must be based on a couple of things. And those principles are what, what you want to do. You want to um, in, uh, retain as much range of move, movement as possible and prevent stiffness and don't have instability. Okay, so you, you don't want instability and you, and you want to get your range of motion. Do we have a broader term for that? Uh, you want to restore function? Yes. Okay, so, so you want to restore function. And what's the other thing you want to do? No, but to, to be painless? Yeah. yeah, you want to be painless, yeah. You want to prevent complications? Yes. Okay, so if you're going to do that, then you must understand what the complications are of a terrible triad injury or a, or a complicated triad. Do you agree? Yes, bro. Okay, so then, Francis, what are the complications that you can... What, what are the complications that you think that uh, happen with... Uh, uh, con with um, a terrible triad. We we'll call it a terrible triad for today. Okay, so um, well, grossly, obviously, instability, but I think more specifically, you're going to have valgus instability of the elbow um, due to the radial head fracture um, if it's okay. left and unfixed. So uh, instability is one thing. So we so when Okay, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you'll probably also be more prone to hyperextension of the elbow with that's the... That instability? Yeah, uh, oh, okay, just as a single... Um, what concept. other complications are you trying to prevent? Uh, you can get probably an ulnar nerve palsy, tidy ulnar okay. nerve palsy. Good, so you can get ulnar nerve symptoms, so neurology. What else? Um, acutely vascular injury. Yeah, unusual, but there can be a vascular injury. You can't really prevent that. That injury is usually there. And if you look at the surgical approaches, which we'll talk about, very unlikely to cause a vascular injury. Mm. Come guys, this is, this is basic orthopedics, eh? Albert, John? Yes, Prof. Um, Come on. So I would uh, break the complications up into potentially early and late. Um, okay. So if we just tackling early, you know, he's going to have a scar. He's going to have uh, early post-operative stiffness. Um, stiffness, okay. So stiffness yeah. definitely a problem, man. Eh? Yeah. So then that that takes me on to the long-term complications. We have to be worried about heterotopic ossification. Okay, um, good. Non-unions, malunions. Um, Very good. Anything else? Um, yeah. Uh, if you've got, you know, maybe a, you've got, if you've got ongoing instability, you'll have ongoing pain um, and you may develop uh, like a, a chronic on the nerve. Um, yeah, so we've said nerves. Yeah. Um, OA. Okay. OA, okay. OA and? Degenerative changes. Um, and recurrent instability. So you prevent instability and recurrent instability. So yes, how do you think we, well, in broad terms, how do you think we prevent these problems? You can, Dan, you just started with us. What do you think, Dan? How do you prevent those problems we've just spoken about? Any thoughts, anybody else? Pravesh, how do you prevent those problems? Yes, Prof, I'm here. How do you so prevent if, those problems, Prave? Yeah, so if, if, if we talk about instability problem, then it will be uh, early surgery by repairing the structures damage and replacing the radial head. If we talk about uh, heterotropic ossification, then it will be post-operative brufen. And then congruency and, st congruency and a stable elbow will prevent uh, probably uh, uh, post-traumatic OA, and then early uh, range of motion will sort of prevent stiffness. And if there is stiffness, we can proceed with a later release as well. Okay. Anybody else want to put anything else in there? We're nearly getting there. Remember what we said the complications are? There's a topic ossification, non-union. How do you prevent OA? 
Uh, so <laughs> it will be basically get an, uh, an anatomical reduction and a congruent elbow. And then, yeah. Okay. Restore anatomy. Yes. Stable elbow, you agree? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we, we covered most of the things now. So that, that's why you must look at the papers like this one from Call, published in this 2021, saying what are the factors with reoperation? So what do you think the biggest reasons are for reoperation in cerebral triad? So I'll tell you, it, it's stiffness, which the majority of those are heterotopic ossification, on a nerve problems, and um, and then mal or non-unions of the uh, of radial head fixation. So, how do we prevent these problems? So, so we've got most of the answers there. So, one of the first things that you've got to do is you've got to make the correct diagnosis, and that will, will be based on your history. So you have an understanding of the mechanism of injury. You must also look at the patient. What is it, what? Is, which group of patients is normally in? Good side. Uh, usually in the young uh, male patients or little patients, and sometimes you know, what's so a I young think, male? Um, I'll say patients who I think age is either between 30 and 40. Yeah, uh, they're, they're in 40, amazing, and they're in 40 year old people. Eh? And if they're in another group of people, which group are they? Uh, elderly patients with soft bones, yeah, the soft bones, so they tend to go to the and are they difficult to manage? Yes, I, I think it's because of the, the fixation options, because they have uh, soft bone and poor bone quality. In terms yeah, of so fixation, you, it's, 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 that's it's, right. It's, so, you yeah. soft, so, so your surgical management is going to change on which type of patient it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your history is important and your clinical parameters preoperatively. And then your, your examination is important, as Jimmy's already outlined. We'll talk about that just now. And then... Um, uh, and then the correct diagnosis. And how do you get the correct diagnosis? Uh, correct diagnosis, uh, one it comes with clinical examination of the patient as well as radiological examination. What radiological examination do you want? Uh, we start off with uh, normal uh, issues. Um, and if, we can, if, not, if it's not clear enough, we can consider taking a CT scan which is bony injured, that is obvious. If not, if it's soft tissue, then you may consider MRI scan. Do you think you may do an MRI in a, in a uh, terrible triad? Yeah, not, 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 not a terrible no. triad. You can pick that no. up clinically. I, I agree with you. So the MRI doesn't really play a role at the moment in, um, in patient. But a CT scan, which ones are you going to be more aggressive to CT scan? For that? Um, I think the ones with uh, radial head fractures that are commutated, that's one, and if you have a coronary fracture that is involving the anterior medial fascia. Yeah, so if you have any doubt about your size or, the, or where the coronary fracture is, and secondly, when you can't clearly identify the radial head, and when your clinical examination doesn't fit what the radiology shows you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's when you're going to get a CT. So here's this paper. This was published this year as well. How to prevent complications. So the first is computed tomography with three-dimensional reconstructions. So that actually, the 3D reconstructions, why do you think they want a 3D reconstruction? Vicious love? Prof, it will give you a, a, a real view of what the actual um, body anatomy looks like. Uh, not not all of us are um, competent in looking at axial, coronal, and sagittal slices. Whereas if you look at the three D construct, you can see the elbow in real, well, not real time, but you could possibly see the um, injury and what's you know how it's affecting the actual position of all of the structures of the elbow, bony, um, bony injuries. I mean. Okay. So, and which part is the most important for you? Um. For me, in this context, I'd probably say um, deciding on how to um, manage it, you know, specifically the coronoid. Um, yeah, you'd have a coronoid. more detailed coronoid, really, and then possibly the radial head if you were struggling to see how many parts were involved. Who, who, who the described the coronoid fractures? Uh, I think it's uh, is it Regan and Mori. 
No, that's not good enough. Uh, uh, three types, uh, depending on a size of fragment involved. So less than 10%, 50%, and more than 50%. Are you really using that all the time now? Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, who wants to improve on Vicious Love's uh, comment? Prof, we're using the Driscoll classification these days. Ah. We're divided into the tip, the anterior media, and the basal fragments. Tip um, is less than two or more than two millimeters, and anterior media is also divided into three and basal into two. Vicious Love, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I've, I've seen one of those lectures at one of the um, workshops. Um, but, you know, in the setting of trauma, um, you're not really seeing the anteromedial portion, are you? Oh, am I mistaken? Are you mistaken? It's okay. very important. Why, why is it important? What does it imply to you when you see a diff, an, an anteromedial or a basal type fracture? Does it imply um, worsening uh, instability? No, uh, it does in a way, but more importantly, uh, because it affects your um, surgical choice, I guess, or whether to fix or not fix. Yeah, it does that. But more importantly, why, there, there's a reason behind it. It's not just because somebody said so. You must understand it, otherwise you you, you can you can't make the correct decision. Is it related to instability? Nick will probably know the answer, Prof. No. <laughs> okay, Nico, Prof. proven price. So the tip is associated with uh, the terrible triad and the sequelae of that, which is opposed to lateral rotatory instability. Where your anteromedial fragment associated, so that you really have to fix, and quite important because that will lead into uh, various rotatory instability, um, which causes point loading and rapid OA where your basal fragment is associated with the trans-electron fracture dislocation, which also needs to be fixed. So There's the controversy the about the tip fixation. Yeah, the importance behind this is actually when you have an anteromedial facet fracture, you have various instability, but more importantly, it's posterior medial instability. And so if you see a patient without a fracture of the radial head, you must think of posterior medial instability. But more importantly, the a recent study, I might show it to you a little bit later, actually showed that quite a few terrible triads also have some posterior medial instability with it because we all thought it was um, uh, a description of posterior lateral inst instability. Johan, who described that? Johan Bosch, who described that? Posterior lateral instability of the elbow. Sorry, Prof, I have no idea. Okay, Santa Marie. Prof, I lateral also... Instability of the elbow. Driscoll. <laughs> Driscoll. Okay. And what, what's the circle called? Copy. Hori circle. Hori circle. Yeah. You guys are going to read about it. I'm not going to show you about it. But the Hori circle. Is it circle an SPA, thing. Prof? Huh? Is it an SPA, Prof? Yeah. I put two questions in exactly on this on the Hori circle and um, very complex. Of course, I haven't. But you, <laughs> you, you should know it because it makes you understand why you're treating patients. So, to, to treat your patients appropriately, you must know mechanism of injury. And the mechanism of injury is from the history, the x-rays, the clinical examination x-rays, which we'll talk about, and then understanding how you interpret those x-rays, because the interpretation of the x-ray, the clinical examination, will, will tell you where the instability, which we'll talk about just now. So you need to know that. that that's why the CT scan of the elbow now has become almost routine if you have a coronary fracture with any suspicion of no radial head fracture, or if it looks bigger than you think it is, or there is instability, which is beyond what you would expect for a radial, um, for a terrible triad or any of the other on the dislocations. So let's go. So how do we prevent the other complications? Prior to surgery, do you listen to this, Chironga? Chironga? Yes, prof. Do you listen yes, prior to I'm surgery? Listening. All equipment potentially needed for the reconstruction must be prepared. That means read the manual, including yes, the screws, suture anchors, plates, prosthesis, external fixators, and so on. So basically, first of all, you must get the correct diagnosis. Secondly, to do that, you need to do history, examination, and imaging. And then you must prepare for surgery. And you must be able to do any type of surgery in the elbow because some of the clinical decision-making is made on the operating table. 
Yes. They recommend a posterior skin incision, which we'll talk about just now, which allows access to both medial and lateral. And we, we, we have really done most of our surgeries from posterior with no wound complications that I know of that were unexpected. Okay. So that means you, allow, you can address both sides. So if you use a posterior incision, you can go lateral, you can go medial, or you can go lateral and medial. Post-operative ulnar nerve functions can be prevented by performing an anterior ulnar nerve transition. I disagree completely. We, we will do an ulnar nerve release in the patients who have. When would you do an ulnar nerve release? Let me see. Ashley, when would you do an ulnar nerve release in a terrible triad? Uh, Prof, I, I think is yes, um, if it, uh, how should I put it? If the the, the nerve, the, the soft tissue around where the nerve sits uh, uh, is likely to develop fibrosis and so on. So you want to get out, get it out of the way. So. And maybe he's going to give me a better answer. Let me just go down. Let me scroll down. I can't see other names here. Moritz, you're on. Do you want to tell me? I'm teasing. Busi, when would you do an ulnar nerve tra transposition? Or when would you do ulnar nerve su surgery? Okay. I, I, as you mentioned, that you tend to do a posterior approach. They emphasize if they've got you, you suspect there might be valgus instability. You also do ulnar nerve uh, release. Okay, you must be quite clear when you want to do an ulnar nerve release. So, Kirsty? Sorry, Prof. Um, I think two reasons I would think if the patient's presenting with ulnar nerve symptoms at the time of dislocation, then you want to explore the nerve. And then secondly, especially with posterior lateral um, rotatory instability, you don't always address the medial side. So I think if you do address your, your, your medial collateral um, and there's tensioning on the nerve, then I would transpose it, but not necessarily always. I think okay, those... So, yeah, so I agree with you. We don't transpose it unless there's a specific reason to transpose it. And the only reason for me to transpose an on the nerve if it's unstable, so don't make it unstable in the surgery, and secondary, secondly, if you need to access that medial side and it's in a way now unstable afterwards. So if you have a big medial fragment that you can't access and it's unstable. But in fact, um, there are several different approaches that we can talk about, but we hopefully will do that later in the year. So it's only, so if you have ulnar nerve symptoms, if you have to do surgery on that, C, on that medial side, you need to decompress the nerve. So you need to release the cubital tunnel and you only transpose it if it's unstable or if it's in the way that you, the only way to get it out the way is to move it. And there's five approaches to, to your medial side. Um, I just want to say the other, there is one other, when it's a chronic case that is stiff, then you need to do release of the nerve because it's one of the reasons for stiffness. And if you don't release it, they will get null and nerve symptoms after it. So you must relieve it in that group. Kurti, do you know how the approaches to the medial side if you're going to do a coronary fixation? Uh, you've got the Hotchkiss approach, uh, Prof, which is over the top. Um, yeah. you it's can a split of the FCU. Yeah, yeah. You split with the FCU. One yeah. is a part of the split of the FCU. Um, you can come around posterior, as you've said, from the posterior skin incision, um, but that it's quite difficult to re reach that anterior medial um, aspect of the coronoid from there. I haven't done yeah. it myself, so... Um, I'm not sure of other approaches to the medial side. Um, you said there okay, were five. So you can lift I... the whole of the FCU up with the ulnar nerve. It's one way. It's a, quite an extensive approach. You can go through the bed where the ulnar, bed of the FCU where the ulnar nerve is. So you keep it behind you. Or you can go through the Hodgkiss approach, which is a split of the FCU. Or you can go over it. And finally, you can do an anterior approach, which in, in the pediatric group, they seem to be doing it for some of the supercondylars and other ones. So that's another approach. And the other way to fix a coronoid is which way, Kirsty? Um, well, you, you're from talking the specific, side. From the yeah, Okay, side. I thought you were saying the specifically yeah. the anterior medial side, yeah, but you are asking me like we did today, yeah. yeah. You can do it from the left foot side. Okay. So post ulnar nerve discomfort can be vented by preferring a transposition. Sorry, let me go back. I did, we disagreed about that. Okay, structures are repaired from deep to superficial from the coronoid 
process and radial head to the lateral collateral ligament, okay? Number six has been renumbered. Attempts should be made to preserve the radial head. Otherwise, a radial head arthroplasty should be performed. That's fairly simple. In fact, um, we believe that it's better, probably, if there's any doubt, rather do a radial head replacement. There is a paper showing slightly better outcomes and less complications by using radial head implant. Both Mike and I have found this. Um, although I'll show you another paper just now which disputes that. We'll talk about radial heads as well. Then you must do stability testing on the operating table. That's why you must have everything in theater. Um, after the reconstruction, so if the elbow dislocates in 30 to 45 degrees of extension, the medial collateral ligament should be repaired. And if it's still unstable, then a dynamic external fixator, which we'll talk about as well, should be put in. So it's very rare that you have to do that. And in fact, there's only one role where I think the external fixator should be used, but we'll talk about that. If the joint does not reach its congruency, the previous step from step five onwards should be repeated. Motion must be started, as Pravesh said, early. So that means the patient must be stable enough and various stress should be avoided. So do you know why the various stress should be avoided? Who wants to, who wants to guess why various stress should be avoided? Anybody? Bayanda, why, why do you want to avoid various stress? Um, with a terrible triad, Prof, you already have lateral ulnar ligament injury. So you would have repaired it intra-op. So you want to protect that. And if you were to stress it, uh, if you were to do a various stress, it's going to um, Absolutely. Stress, your, yeah. stress your repair. And there's another reason? Um, depending on whether you've done a radial head replacement or not? No. Okay. No. I am not sure then, Prof, other than Put, the... That's on your, on, you're putting your stress on your coronoid. If you go okay. into various, remember we said that's how you get instability, posterior medial instability is your coronoid. So if your coronoid fix is tenuous or if you haven't fixed it, it may add to some instability. And if you have a posterior medial, I mean a uh, anterior medial facet, you want to protect that fixation is not very great. So various should always be avoided. Eh? And if you look at nearly all our movements, the elbow is in various because we always abducting the arm to do most of our movements. So most of the various stress, so you really got to avoid that. Okay? And the functional range of motion, you can usually get 110 degrees, which if you look at that, that's not great. Eh? What's our functional arc of range of motion, Francis? What's the functional range of motion that, that we need the elbow to go through to, to be able to function? You know? Sorry, I, for, I didn't unmute myself. Um, 30 to 130 degrees of flexion, Prof. Yeah, so 100 degrees. Do you think the elbow only flexes and extends? Uh, also pronates and supinates. So How much? Uh, normal is uh, 70 to 80 degrees of each. So functional, probably more pronation, 60 degrees and supinate to neutral. Okay, so it varies 45 to 45. Okay. Well, some people prefer 50 50 is what you need. Okay. And post operative joint stiffness procedure removal or ulnar service may require additional procedures. However, arthritis is usually tolerable, which is surprising. You think there's a role for conservative treatment? Who thinks there's a role for conservative treatment? Nico? Prof, I'll be very guarded to uh, treat this conservatively, um, especially uh, depending on what's happening on the coronoid side. Uh, so in general, no. Someone can treat it conservatively. I'll show you a paper. Excellent Jimmy, outcomes. Yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy said 90% of them do well, didn't he? No, that's simple elbow dislocations. Oh, for apologies, Prof. Yes, yes. This is I up. don't know. I don't know, Prof. <laughs> right room, wrong would, hotel. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, Prof. Would patient factors be one of the reasons, depending on whether the patient is a surgical candidate or not, would you consider 
Yeah, maybe that's not going to be the real driving force. Okay, so yeah. I'll tell you now. Okay. Okay, so there's several articles about whether you should fix the coronary fracture. And there is a paper showing conservative treatment with some good out really good outcomes. But you need to have this, a close reduction. You assess the elbow instability. So if they can get 30, they can extend to 30 degrees without popping out. Must have a concentric joint reduction. The radial head fracture mustn't cause mechanical block to motion, and you must have a type one or two Mori. Okay, you certainly can't have an anteromedial facet, and the stable arc of motion, as I said, and you must start moving them early, gently. Okay, I usually protect these patients if I'm going to treat them conservatively for ten days to two weeks, and in fact, we've just had somebody who was referred to us at only at three weeks for his. Um, terrible triad, and he had a displaced radial head fragment that was sitting out. In fact, if you'd seen it primarily, we would have fixed it. In fact, he had a good range of motion, and we just watched him. We took him to theater. He had no gross instability, so we left him. We excised his radial um, head. That was about four weeks, and we left him alone, and I think I saw him at six months with uh, a good range of motion and no instability. So there's definitely a role for conservative treatment but you must be very caref careful on your clinical examination and meet these criteria. Okay, so there is a role for conservative treatment. This is an example from one of their patients treated conservatively, the radial head fracture. I'm probably, but they would have done a range of motion on this, so it wouldn't have lost range of motion. And he had a quite a big um, uh, facet, uh, coronary facet, but this is one of their patients in their patient they treated conservatively with good outcomes. Okay. However, you can't treat this patient conservatively. A larger coronary fracture, you can see it there. You can see it extends anteromedial. So if you have an oblique line extending dorsally and medially, that coronoid needs to be fixed. Okay. Um, and you can see this radial head fracture. So this patient has a terrible triad that needs surgery. So the clinical decision. So Driscoll, as we've mentioned before, Originally, this was his um, type 1, 2, and 3, which is now subclassified. And these were the or original classified by Reagan and Murray, um, where 1, 2, and 3. Unfortunately, the fracture types are not that simple. Probably in a true uh, terrible triad, the definition before, they, most of these fractures are into these three types on the left. Sorry, on the right, Reagan and Murray. The, the Driscoll classification really does look at posterior medial instability rather than the terrible triad. But as I said earlier, we all thought terrible triads did not get posterior medial facet fractures. But this is not true. There, a recent study has shown that some of them have posterior medial instability. And as uh, Nico said, this is what you need to know. Tip one to two makes no difference. Anterior medial is an important one. Two and three definitely probably need surgery. Um, but the clinical examination will help you on that. And the BASI, as you said, usually is associated with the transalecranon fracture at this occasion. Okay, so, so we've discussed already the clinical findings by Jimmy, what we need to do. So if you're doing a posterior medial, this is the case that we did today. He had a terrible triad that was shown at our meeting this morning. And this is the clinical examination. So very gentle flexion extension and he's stable in flexion extent. Remember, he's got a completely displaced radial head. We put him into valgus. And you can see as he comes here, he just got a little click there. So he's falling into various instability, into valgus. But this is more important here. We can see there. Can you see how he pops out the back then? So that is posterior lateral instability, but also medial instability. And if you look, he's got swelling on both sides of the elbow. There, complete various instability. And in fact, if you look at it, his lateral instability seems very good. So his various instability is from his absent radial head. And if we look at the draw test, no anterior draw test to suggest. But there you can see how he's, he's popping out there. So this patient needs definitely the lateral structures need to be fixed first and then reassessed. They can see that, so that's various instability. So if you take a patient to theater and they do this, 
with a simple elbow dislocation, they need fixation. First of lateral and then medial. If you have a coronoid fracture and they show that various instability, they also need that coronoid fix then. Not all patients who are stiff are not unstable. And this is one of the things that you mustn't miss. So this is a missed injury. So one of the problems, complications are missed injuries. And you can see this patient has an instability, but is stiff as well. Eh? This patient, so you don't have to be um, stiff to be unstable. And here's the patient, this is his CT scan. So he's had a terrible triad. He's projecting forward onto this. You can see his coronary fracture, he's subluxing out the back, and he's got an old radial head fracture. <sighs> Let me just ask you, Nico, what would you do for this patient? So prob uh, probably two issues to address here. Um, as you say, he's stiff and unstable. Uh, the stiffness, uh, one would address by uh, posterior Posterior uh, lateral and medial release. So, um, and then secondary. Well, of course, you'll have to assess the, the patient's uh, com comorbid function. If it's a it's an elderly patient that um, doesn't have high demand, then immediately you can. That will be a different type of operation. But for this patient that you shown here, uh, do a capsular release and well. I uh, would need to augment the um, anterior capsule uh, because that would be off and probably do, if his wrist is stable, either radial head resection or arthroplasty. Depends on what, um, I mean, it's old injury. Uh, yeah, radial head resection is probably not first on the list, so rather arthroplasty. Okay, so this is a young patient. So you must have an approach to the stiff elbow. And what is your approach to stiff elbow? Quickly, one minute. Uh, Prof, I need to determine what's causing the stiffness. Is it a bony block um, or is it soft tissue that's fibrosed, HO? Um, and if it's a bony block, you'll have to excise the, the bony okay, structures. Let's go back, let's Otherwise... go back a step, Nico. You need yeah. to decide, is it extrinsic or intrinsic? Yes. If yes. it's intrinsic, it's capsule, malunion, or nonunion, eh? Yeah. Probably malunion stuff. If it's extrinsic, it is extra, it's, um, uh, it can be a fracture nonunion or malunion. It can be heterotopic ossification. It can be um, metal wear, ulnar nerve, or other problems. So you need to break it down into those before you make the decision what needs to be said. Intrinsic and extrinsic. They all have a capsular tightness. And you can't release just anteriorly. You must release anterior and posteriorly. You'll never get this. So this patient needs a release. That's the first thing it needs. The instability is related to what? Uh, the fact that so his anterior capsule is completely off by the evidence of that is the tip of the coronoid fracture. And um, the radial head that's part of the static stabilized also um, fraction community, probably as an LC, uh, lateral or lateral injury as well. Um, well, this doesn't so, even have to be stressed if you look where his, look where his, look where his joint sitting on the bottom left picture. So he has stiffness and instability. The stiffness is easily addressed by a capsule release anterior posterior and a triceps release so he can now um, flex up. You need to remove whatever bone or stuff is in the front because that'll be blocking that capsule will be done. And then you must provide stability. And the stability will be, you need to reconstruct the coronary so that you can use, what can you use for the coronary reconstruction? So if the fragments begin, well, so usually we'll, we will use an anchor uh, or just suture fixation through the bone. Um, but if there's yeah, large this is, this piece, is a chronic case. This is a missed one. Uh, if there's a large enough piece, I suppose you can put a screw through. Jimmy, what do you think you can? Okay, we'll give you a break here, Nico. What do you think, Jimmy? Mute myself. So you can use a bone graft to reconstruct that buttress. 
That's right. So you need to reconstruct the coronoid. That's the first thing. How, how, what bone graft did you use, Jimmy? Uh, so you can look at some ana anatomically shaped bone graft we have. If you look at the distal tibia, uh, the, the pilon shape can give you that concavity of the, co the coronoid, so you can use that piece. If it so you're going to take his piece of his tibia? No, you're using allograft. Oh, okay, okay. So you're using allograft. So that's, that's one I can think of. Uh, I'm not sure which, you can also shape an autograft, uh, but if you want good concavity, you can use uh, a pilon fragment. Okay, so what we normally use is that radial head if it's useless. So we pull the radial, we do an, a radial head osteotomy, radial neck osteotomy and, and shape the, the radial head. If the radial head is not available, you use a piece of rib described by Greg Bain. Mori and Sotelo and Mansat, I think, have written up using the radial head as a for non-reconstructable thing. You can use allograft. Well, like I said, like you said, remember they get fresh allograft there. So that's what they do. In fact, they use coronoid. They use fresh frozen um, coronoid fragments, Jimmy. So you're right. So they're not using the distal tibia so much, but the coronoid. Uh, so that will reconstruct the coronoid. If you can see on this view, you can see this patient also has the Hillsax lesion of the capitulum. So that's called a, a what lesion, Pravesh? The Hillsax of the coronoid, of the um, capitulum? I don't know. Osborne cotral. Osborne cotral lesion. Okay, so if that's big enough, then you can either graft that, but we very seldom do that. You put a radial head in. So we'll replace the radial head and then we will reconstruct the ligaments. After six weeks, you can't repair the ligaments, you reconstruct them. Or you can put them in an X-ray. Okay. So, so here's a patient, another patient was a chronic um, turbo trier that was missed, came to us several weeks down the lane. All we did was release it. There was enough of the radial head to leave the radial head, you can see. The coronary do we just pull back, we put an external fixator on, and here's a video of the reduction, which is stable. We keep the triceps on, and it's amazing how stable. Let me see if the video can work. There we go. There's elbows completely dislocated. You can see the uh, radial head, triceps on, and we pop it back in. There we go. And there's the range of motion. Eh? Not great, but you put it in x fix and you remain stable. Right, the next problem that you get is stiffness. How do you prevent stiffness? Uh, let's see, John, how do you prevent stiffness when you're doing the terrible try -in? So, what are the causes? Well, first of all, what are the causes of stiffness when you're doing a terrible try -in? So it could be it could be both well intrinsic or extrinsic. So intrinsic yeah. could be if you if you still have a mal union. Yeah. Um, or if you've gone on to non-union, uh, yeah. then you're going to get uh, you're going to get early post-surgical um, adhesions and things like that. That so your your early so surgery itself can cause a stiffness. Yeah. Um, then, as you've spoken, then extrinsic things like the ulnar nerve, um, good. and and then later on heterotopic ossification. Um, okay. Good. We'll talk about that just now. Yeah. And then and then and then your muscle stiffness. Your uh, muscles traversing the joints can, can become stiff. Yeah. You can see something from here that think they, they think why this might be stiff. Kirsty, uh, why might this be stiff? I think um, that radial head is overstuffed. So if you don't get the sizing of, of the replacement drafts, then the patient will become stiff. Absolutely. So you, you must get the correct size of the prosthesis, not only in the uh, diameter, but also in Longitudinally, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You don't want it to Anything be... Anything else on this x-ray that tells you it might be stiff? If, if another iatrogenic cause of stiffness, Prof, would be if you don't get the isometric point of your... Uh, Absolutely. You know, Look at where those anchors are, right? Eh? This can't you be yours, the Prof. anchors, eh? They're not in the isometric point. So one of the tricks is not to use an anchor and go through bone, and then the soft tissue will settle, and those anchors will cut... The sutures will cut gently through the bone and it'll readapt. So I think um, I, I learned the lesson when we probably got it a bit off center and it pulled the anchor out. You can see the anchor in the soft tissue and you remain stable after it's much better except for this free floating anchor. 
So in fact, that's one of the risks of using an anchor if you don't get it in the isometric point. Kirsty, how, how do you make sure you've got the correct radial head size? Um, well, you you take uh, if the, the excised head that you can take out, you use to measure. Yeah, um, good. And then, and then um, you're going to trial it. <laughs> um, okay. And you want the, the top of the radial head to be a sort of two millimeters below the, the, the olecranon joint line, essentially. So to prevent... Yeah, because the articular, the articular surface of the joint. Yeah. Again, so if you look from lateral... The articular surface that's there, you can see, should be parallel. In fact, if you pronate and supinate, you see that actually moves by about two millimeters. So that's why you must actually, it's not just two millimeters recess, because it may be four millimeters recess, depending how you move it, because it's not a smooth circle that goes on, okay? So I'll show you that just now. And what other ways can you check that you've got the correct, so you've checked it on the head, so you must always undersize or oversize the head. Uh, on, on undersizing it properly. Undersize the diameter. And how do you know that you've got the length correct? Besides using the, the electron on particular um, surface from lateral. Well, where it sits, it's articulation with the ulna. Um, no, that's what you said. You can use x-rays. You can look yes. at the x okay. AP. You can see that the joint line is parallel. Just remember that the medial, the lateral facet may look as wide and open a little bit, but that's normal. You may see the medial joint line of the uh, on a humeral joint is parallel. And what else must you make sure? Of? Um, if they have an SX lepresti injury, so you should have measured the wrist. If they have, then you must make sure that the wrist is, is returned to its normal resting point. So you should actually image the opposite side, the wrist and the elbow. So when you put this in, you should see that the wrist is length is restored and by, by, by your radial head replacement when you're trialing. Okay. So now we've spoken about heterotopic ossification. You can see this is post-dislocation, massive uh, heterotopic ossification. Who would get this? Come out, who would get this? Who would you see this in? Uh, prof, um, so it'd be patients with head injuries. It would be okay, quite good. Quite common now. Okay, which other group of patients do you see this in? Um, so patients with other neurological um, issues. Okay, so neurology, yeah, neurology, um, anything else? Um, not too sure which other patients. Okay, flipping around the hip, we see if patients have DISH. Do you know what DISH is? Yeah, um, diffuse, uh, I'll get to the... Idiopathic. Um, Diffuse. Up and out. Yeah, yeah. Neil, up and out. What is it? Diffuse idiopathic skeletal hypostosis. Yes, hypostosis. Yeah. Okay, so that's the other group. But more importantly for the elbow, which which other patients do you think more at risk? Diana? Um... I'm not sure, Prof. And Disha? Okay, I'll put you out in misery. Polytraumas yes, and right. other injuries on that side. Any other idea, Andisha? Who else gets this? Uh, so, yeah, as uh, Hamad uh, mentioned now, neurological patient, uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, um, yeah. Pathological Poly fracture. Trauma patients, polytrauma patients and patients with ipsilateral injuries. So if you have a shoulder yeah. or wrist injury as well. And there's another group of patients we see in people who have delayed surgery for more than a week or they have a dislocation that's been out for a while that's not quickly reduced or very unstable. They're more likely to have um, heterotopic ossification. Okay. And yeah. uh, here we can see um how extensive it can be you need to do removal of heterotopic ossification as well as a capsule release otherwise you'll never get them okay so we've discussed most of the neurological complications following other trauma delayed ulnar nerve is definitely one is um, um if they get stiff um or with a lot of swelling on the medial side you may have to do an ulnar nerve release uh, as i was mentioning earlier we just leave the nerve 
in the groove, all we do is we make sure we release the cubital tunnel right down into the FCU so there's no, uh, no tightness with the swelling, okay? So that we have a slightly different problem. Okay, so the role of the hinges external patient, we, we seldom use it for these patients. We use it for uh, the patients who have arthritis or cartilage loss or the chronic elbow dislocations. How long do you leave it on if you're putting it on? So the only real patients I use it for the terrible triad patients are the ones when I do a reconstruction of the coronoid, which is tenuous, and I fix the radial head, and I'm worried that the radial head and the coronoid are not strong enough to withstand normal forces of the elbow, because most of the forces are directed, which way, Jake, Yoppy? Most of the forces in the elbow are directed? No. Posteriorly, Prof? Posteriorly, exactly. So your coronoid and your radial head, if you put a radial head replacement in, it's, it's probably safer on your coronoid than not. So if there's any doubt in that there's going to tenuous fix, I'd rather do a radial head uh, fixation when I do the coronary. But if, if I fix both and I'm worried, I would put an external fixator on to prevent those forces to allow the coronoid and the radial head to be fixed. So it's very seldom you have to do this. And in fact, I can't remember putting in one for a terrible try that wasn't chronic that I wanted to uh, reconstruct. But um, the external fixator has changed. So you now can see an internal joint stabilizer and there's two types that we've been seeing. You can see this was published in June last year. And here they put a, they find the center of rotation and you can see what they do is a plate and an articulated hinge through the center of rotation. And that's what it looks like. So it protects your uh, radial head fixation. Um, this obviously looks uh, a bit crazy because I don't see any coronoid fixation really there. I'm missing something there, so I'm not sure why they had to do this. And if you look at the joint line, he's not that elbow is not reduced. Eh? If you ask me, that elbow is not reduced at all, or it's got OA. So I'm not sure why. Okay, there is another group of patients that get instability, and that's with the olecranon fractures. You must know where the attachments of the ligaments are before, otherwise you're going to end up with this problem. You see this instability. So if your fracture is beyond the attachment of the LCL or the MCL, usually the MCL, you're going to have instability of the elbow. So beware of that group. Okay, let me, we've nearly finished, guys. I'm just going to talk about one or two other uh, things that have come up. Okay, so they looked at the different ways of fixing the terrible triad. This was in 2020. And they looked at their meta-analysis, and they couldn't find any really difference whether you go medial, lateral, or posterior approaches. They thought that you did, if you did a combined approach, it was slightly better um, than a lateral approach, but there was more complications. Um, I think you can go medial or lateral. I started going medial or lateral because I think it's a little bit easier sometimes to address the lateral stuff. And if you really need to do medial, it's quite a big dissection, so I'm now moved to doing posterior, I'm sorry, both-sided approach. I mean, when I was at the Mayo Clinic in 2003, four, five, and six, I went to a bunch of meetings, nearly everybody was doing a posterior approach, but we gradually moved to doing medial and lateral approaches, okay. Um, okay, so the radial head we've already discussed, you need to uh, give a stable fixation, so, if you can't get a stable fixation of the radial head or neck, then you must do a replacement. Um, there is a paper that looked at patients with very small coronoid, type 1 coronoid, where they've done a radial head excision and left them in plaster for a period of time with some excellent results. So we were always taught that if you took the radial head out in a terrible trial, they all did badly. I think there is a different, there are some groups where the, we have a type one, Bragg and Murray or Driscoll, that you can take the radial head out. And um, I've seen one or two that have been done by other surgeons who didn't have a radial head replacement in and couldn't fix the radial head um, and then had to just close up. And in fact, they're done well if they left them in plaster and the medial side healed up. The medial side has um, been shown by several different papers but you don't have to fix the medial collateral ligament unless there's instability. In fact, if you fix the medial collateral ligament, you have more risk of HO and stiffness and on a nerve symptom. So you only do it when you have to fix the medial side. So if they have various instability after you fix, after you fix the 
the radial head, the lateral collateral, and the coronoid, then you must do the MCL. Um, this paper in 2000 November actually showed there were worse outcomes when you when you put a radial head replacement in. So in fact, I'm not that, I'm not that surprised because most patients who have radial head fractures probably have got worse injuries. So it's probably due to the injury rather than the radial head replacement. In a randomized group, it showed there was not much different in the groups with a fixation. What is the problem with this fixation, Aik, if you're doing a radial neck, radial head fixation? Could the radial intervene with the range of motion, supination, pronation uh, movements? Yeah. So that is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So if you plate the side, they almost universally get stiff, so they have to take them out. The plate, if you plate a radial neck, um, so you must have a stable fix. You must put it in the, uh, on, in the correct position to get your range of motion, and invariably you've got to take it out. But once you remove them, they seem to recover their range of motion of pronation and supination. So if there's any doubt, I would put a radial head replacement rather than that thing. Um, okay, so here's a paper to support radial head outcomes at three years, and there's been some longer term and that was publication was also in the last year. And then there is talk about different, if you use a monopolar and a bipolar. So Yapi, what do you think, if you put a bipolar in, what do you think the problem is with the bipolar? And what's the advantage of putting a bipolar radial head compared to a monopolar? I've never heard of the bipolar radial head replacement before, so we... The one I know is monoblock, and I suppose if you put a, a bipolar, it will give you more, probably improved motion at not a, not only at flexion extension, but supination pronation. Will, I think the only advantage it would give that wouldn't add stability, wouldn't constrain it more to prevent recurrent dislocations. I think the only advantage would be to improve your range. That's what I would think. Improve range and. Prevention of OA. So if you look at the, even the anatomical ones, if you put them in, you never reproduce the same anatomy. So your forces and your contact forces, the radial ulnar joint and the, and so, yeah, the radial ulnar joint and at the uh, humeral radial joint, are, you've got a piece of metal that is not like your native humeral head, um, radial head. And so your OA is worse and pain and stuff, although that's not found. And that's one of the reasons I, I like using the loose BMG pro um, uh, product. So it actually it's a loose stem. So it's loose in the radius. So it actually got some uh, sort of like bipolarity by being loose in the humerus. And they, they've got long-term results. They're pretty good, no worse than everybody else. The disadvantages of bipolar, if there's any instability, especially posterior lateral instability, they can actually dislocate. Um, uh, so, yeah, and here we've already mentioned the prolonged, this is just recent study, June 2020, prolonged dislocation, delay surgery, higher rates of heterotopic ossification in that group of patients. Here's <coughs> radial head replacement, good results in this group using the Hotchkiss. Um, uh, well, the Hotchkiss, is, he named it the terrible triad. And this quickly, heterotopic ossification, meta-analysis, Meta-analysis, no difference whether you want to do radiation or no radiation, sorry, radiation or anti-inflammatories. And in fact, they stopped a study on fractures around the elbow where they were randomized into two groups. It was stopped ethically because there were more complications in the radiation group. So uh, there's no radiation in my mind in acute trauma around the elbow. You use you use Brufen. We showed in the, in the um, pelvises that if you gave it preoperatively, so if you have a head injured patient, you can take an anti-inflammatory or you've got a delay to surgery, I would start an anti-inflammatory early. Indesit was the most studied one, but Brufen is shown to be as effective and in fact Celebrex as well. Probably most of the anti-inflammatories, but we're not sure. Okay. What about current concepts? Really, we're trying to understand the, the pathology because to try and prevent those complications we're talking about, especially OA and instability, and to do that now, now looking at, they were looking at all the different types of fractures that have been associated. And here you can see um, uh, the different fracture patterns and they mapped it out, like we're doing with the scapula, 
with the terrible tries and, and with other elbow injuries, trying to determine which fracture pattern you get with which um, with, with, with each injury so you can try and plan the surgery better and understand what you're trying to achieve surgically, both for, inst both for stability and for range of motion and prevention of complication. Okay, so I hope that's given you an understanding of terrible triads. Lots of things have been written uh, recently about it. Um, nothing really new, I think, uh, since the Driscoll's definition of the different types of coronary fractures that have changed radically. Um, the approach is, if we go back to the beginning, is to prevent all the complications, which we've discussed already. So if you do go to theatre, you must do an ELA for instability preoperatively and postoperatively after you've refixed everything. And the approach is fix or replace a radial head, always repair the lateral collateral. There's no doubt that that has been proven time after time. The coronoid type one, you can leave if it's stable when the examination. If it's not, you suture it down through drill holes or through an anchor. If the fragment is bigger and you can fix it from lateral, you fix it from lateral. If you can't, you must do a medial approach and fix a coronoid. That will fix your medial collateral if it's a problem. If your coronoid is small and you fix the capsule down and it's still stable medially, then you do a medial ligament repair as well. And if that fails, you put an internal or an external fixator, uh, a hinged external fixator. Um, we haven't used any of the infixes, but I think it's certainly something worth exploring for the time being. Okay, guys, that's an hour and a half. Any questions? Prof, can I just ask you about coronoid um, fractures to clarify? You no longer want us to use, you reckon, Mori, you just want us to use the Driscoll classification now regarding tip, anteromedial, and basal or am I, uh, I i think if you have a terrible triad you can still use reagan and Murray, but you must yeah. have an understanding that that all terrible triads are not the same mechanism of injury we think it's mostly a posterior lateral instability that happens but if you hit by a bus to tell me that you've got posterior lateral instability especially you fly through the air you hit your elbow you fly through the air and you land on your desiccated elbow with your coronary out the way you can have a much more complex injury than a simple terrible triad type classification. And that's what they've shown in a study that's just been published in the last year. The coronary fracture fragments do not support what we think is just a terrible triad. You can get posterior medial instability with it, and then you need to address that. So you, I think, I think for the exam, you should know Driscoll's classification. Unfortunately, I can't remember it very well, so I have to look it up every time. But my clinical examination, and if I have any suspicion, the CT scan will allow me to have a look at that to see whether the sublime tubercle is involved or not. And one of the easiest ways to test for postromedial instability is you put, put the arm into abduction and ask the patient to flex extend. And if they can't flex and extend because they feel like it's going to pop out or it subluxes out, you have postromedial instability and that needs to be fixed. Eh? Does that help? Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, all right, it's fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you need to know Driscoll's classification. Prof, can I, I've got one or two questions, please. Yes. So, Prof, I just want to ask, um, so previously I Driscoll described the hoary circle coming from yeah. lateral, so your injury pattern from lateral to medial in a, in a lateral rotatory instability, so, or in the, in the terrible triad, are we disregarding that um, no, no, that, not at uh, all. That, not at all. That, that pattern has been shown to be well, very well. But the, 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 that list, um, let me just see if I did get it here. Let me just see here. The fracture patterns here, um, they, they've they looked at them and they there were more medial coronal fractures than lateral overall. And the same trend was observed in terrible triad injury, yeah? which is contrary to our hypothesis. Okay. So these yes. studies are now showing them that, that everything is not what we think it is. You have to evaluate the patient um, more carefully than just accepting that your terrible triad is always a type one or type two coronary fracture. And it may be some posteromedial instabil poster instability as well. So the horror is definitely true, eh? but it, right. not, it can't be applied to every single case. 
Yes, so you individualized and in, according to your yeah. to your findings and on examination. Yeah. I, I think we under-examine the patients because we don't get the opportunity to get the patient to theater. You know, can you imagine if we talk elbow, every elbow dislocation to theater? So I usually use a clinical examination. Once they're reduced, I ask them to flex extend. And if, if, if they're too sore at the beginning, what you do is put them in a the plaster and bring them back a few days. And more importantly for me is I test flexor and extensors. And if I feel that they've a vast the flexor or the, extent, or the extensor mass, they need surgery. But they'll be so unstable when they, if you put them in abduction and ask them to flex extend, they'll, they'll go into a meter, or you lie them down and put them uh, flat that you actually put the arm and you, you, you ask them to flex extend. If they're unstable or they can't do it, it means they're too unstable. And then you, you can do an MRI, and if that extensor mass or flexor mass is off, they need surgery. Yeah? Prof, so that is simple. Are you, do you really? The infix, will you try? Are you. Um, Will you try doing that instead of the of a of a X fix? Yeah, so, in... yeah, I think that X fix is a pain in the butt. They get infections. They can get fractures afterwards, and it's a mess to look after. So I think we'll definitely try the infix. But if you look at it, it's usually for fatter people. If you've got a thin arm, that thing's right under the skin, and they've had some skin problems with it. So, and there's two types. There's one with a, a plate on the ulna and a plate on the on the uh, humerus. And the other one is like that, with just a screw across the the center of rotation. So, well, that's quite I a think, thin screw running through there. Yeah, yeah. But it, but you remember it's that loaded because it's it's, it's already look, And on that X-ray, prof, it looks loose already. There's loosency around that, so. It's, yeah, it I might be know. loose, and, and if you look at the joint line, it's either subluxed or he's got rapid OA because. The, there's no joint line there. So I, if I go back here, let's just quickly go back. Uh, it was in my PowerPoint. So if we just go back here. So if you look around that TP, screw on the lateral side. Yeah, if we make this big, let me just try and make this not sure, from current slide. So if we look at that joint line, yes, there's no joint line there, right? Eh? So either they it's not reduced properly, although it doesn't look too bad here. I can't see the coronoid. So this this does not look good there. For me, this is not in. And you know, as I said, whenever you look at people's papers and go and look at what they published, if this is the best picture that they can give you of their technique, it doesn't it's not reassuring, is it? The professor, my elbow, you must just put an X fix on, please, not this <laughs> thing. No, most terrible trials don't need an X-Fix. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. Okay, we'll put a Steinman pin across. Any Thanks, Prof. Prof, I just want to ask something uh, with, relate, with relation to what Jimmy said. So most uh, posterior lateral elbow dislocations, Jimmy said the latest literature shows that there's medial ligament damage. But with the terrible triads, and according to the circle, it's still lateral first, radial head, coronoid, and then medial last. Um, I'm just struggling to understand this concept. Yeah, so, so, so with, with the terrible triad, you can usually use the hoary circle, and that is the medial collateral can go last. And you must remember, sometimes it's pulled off like a sleeve avulsion. But if you look at the MRI scan, so most of the, so quite a few of these were before MRIs or decision making before. I mean, if you look at the MRIs now in a normal posterior dislocation of the elbow, the MCL is injured more, is more than the lateral collateral. Jimmy can correct me. But you still have a large flexor mass and you still have the bony, olecranon and other, other things that actually give you enough stability that you don't have to repeat, repair the medial collateral. The lateral Collateral is one that causes more recurrent instability than the medial side because of the because of the bony anatomy and the, the forces that are on it. If you look at it, if you abduct your arm, it, all your forces are going to your lateral collateral unless you've got a coronoid fracture. So your coronoid, if your coronoid is intact, you're you're less likely to um, fall into posterior medial instability. So posterior medial instability is with a fracture. The posterior lateral is from the, the posterior corner. So it's, it, I, I hear what you're saying. It's a bit more difficult because you, you thought that everything was lateral collateral, but it's not. That's on the posterior dislocations. Jimmy, do you agree? 
Uh, absolutely, Prof, I, I agree. Uh, and the message we're trying to get across is not one single mechanism of injury is true yeah. for all postrolateral uh, elbow dislocations and every patient must be examined on its own merit to determine what actually structures are injured. You will find a repeating pattern of injury, but it may not be true for every single case. And the repeating pattern of injury for the terrible triad is that most injuries are on the lateral side. And once you fix the lateral side, you've done the coronoid, you've done the radial head, you've done the ulnar collateral, you should be okay. But you must still test the medial side. Yeah. If you're still unstable, that means you have a medial problem which you're going to have to address. Yeah. What's interesting, the pressure if, uh, lateral you ought to know. We, we see more posterior lateral instability in elbow dislocations. And in fact, most of them are not the, the really bad ones, unless you pulled off the flexor extensor mass. And in fact, if the guys would yeah. be seen today, let me just see if I can put this up. Uh, let me escape. Let me just see if I can get this video. Uh, cancel. Let me go here. If we go here, this is today's case. If we have a look at this video, there's the radial head out the back here, and you can see there's the coronoid. You can see the electron surface there. If we just go back, let me just pause that. There we can see the radial head. There's the edge of the ulna. So we can see one to two millimeters. And as we rotate it, you'll see the, the, the head gets closer to that articular surface there. Can you see there's the articular surface? And as we reduce it, you can see how it's opening. And you can't, um, sorry, you can see this is all peeled off. It's actually peeled off. You see it's intact all the way up there. It's, it's, the whole piece is peeled off. So it just sticks down into the normal position. It just gets all stuck down. It's like a sleeve. Unfortunately, my other video didn't come out today from, the, from it. Eh? Okay, that's enough. It's 22.